Uh, hope you can find your seats to sit down. I'm William Widmark from Stockholm University. I will chair this session. And we will welcome Tom Wilson. And he's a senior professor at the University of Borås at the Library and Information Science. And he will talk to us about the e-book phenomenon. That's hard to pronounce when you're not English speaking. But uh, hopefully this will be really interesting. He has a four-year project in Sweden with the Research Council in Sweden about e-books, and he will talk more about the project. It has run for one year. So the floor is yours, Tom. Uh, thank you uh, for that introduction, and uh, my thanks to the, the organizing committee for inviting me to uh, give this keynote, thereby enabling me to uh, visit once again the city of Riga. Uh, the first occasion was a good many years ago. Uh, I was with a, a group of colleagues from various parts of Eastern Europe, and uh, we visited the then National Library, and I recall Andrus Wilkes showing us a model of this building. So it's uh, very interesting to experience the reality. I think that the, the model indicated that there was going to be rather more glass than has turned out to be the case, and I'm sure that uh, there were very various design changes in the interim. Uh, as our chairman has said, my interest in e-books is uh, connected with the research project I'm working on in Sweden. This is a four-year project funded by the Swedish Research Council uh, to the tune of 12 million Swedish krona, which is approximately one and a half million dollars for those who like to work in that money. Uh, we're going to examine the impact of the e-book throughout the entire uh, production and use chain from authorship through to readership, taking in publishers, booksellers and libraries as well. We're conducting surveys of the general population through the SOM survey, which is an annual survey of the Swedish population. Uh, two of our colleagues working on the project work at the Song Institute, which uh, runs this uh, national survey, and we have questions in about e-book reading over the four-year period, so we will be able to collect, as it were, longitudinal data about the impact of the e-book in the general population. I'll begin with a... Uh, an introduction to the notion of the e-book. Some claim that uh, the concept predates the computer technology that makes the e-book actually possible. And uh, I shan't push all of the alternative definitions to you, but simply adopt my own, which is fairly simple and straightforward. That is, an e-book is a screen presentation with book-like qualities. It gets rid of all the technical stuff that you usually get in these definitions. And I think that that adequately explains what an e-book is. The boundaries between book and film and between book and game are widely touted as about to bring about a revolution in the e-book with the notion of enrichment being central to this idea. But there are other voices that say this isn't going to happen or that it isn't going to happen anytime soon. Mainly because, unlike paper, which is an international standard for everybody, printing books, uh, there isn't a standard format for the enriched e-book. Even for text, the different devices use different formats and different standards. So for a publisher, seeking to hit the mass market, uh, the problem of enrichment is central to the difficulty of the lack of a standard format for the presentation of the material. The key element uh, in the book, to my mind, is the page. Books consist of pages. And the notion of the page is replicated 
in the e-book readers. You turn a page by touching the screen. On some of the uh, applications, you can actually see the page turning as you draw your finger across the screen. So there's a general perception that turning the page is an intrinsic part of reading the book, and that gets carried across into the electronic version. And the page has particular qualities for us. We can scribble notes in the margin. We can highlight bits of text. We can stick post-it notes on the tops of the pages to locate things that we want to go back to. Stick paper clips in, whatever. Hmm? And although some of these things can be accomplished with the e-text, more or less by analogy, it isn't quite the same as working with the simple tools of pencil or pen and post-it note and marker physically with the page. So there has not really been, so far as one can tell, a tremendous take-up of the equivalent features in the e-book. People still like to work with the physical text for many purposes. In other words, this is what the, the computer sciences call the affordances of paper, which are different from the qualities afforded by uh, the computer screen. The shift from the uh, scroll, the paper scroll or the papyrus scroll before it, uh, to the codex form must have been quite a problematical moment in the history of uh, the printed text. And there's a uh, Norwegian, I don't know if this is going to work, there's a Norwegian video that you might all have seen about the monastic help desk. Um, let's, let's see if it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter because you've probably all seen it. It's where the monk comes in representing the help desk to get the, uh, the guy uh, sorted out in using the book, the codex form, instead of using the scroll. And of course, the humor carries on into uh, the e-book generally. If you, if you search for e-book cartoons on Google, you get hundreds of them. Um, one that I rather liked is this one. Do you have any books on how to get my Kindle to work? <clears throat> and uh, it is a rather curious phenomenon that uh, there is published by Riley a whole series of uh, books um, that should have been the manual that wasn't there, you know? And you can get manuals on how to use the Kindle or how to use the iPad or whatever, even although no manual comes with these devices, or it's a very trivial manual that comes with them. Let's, uh, let's just see how far this technology has penetrated this audience. Um, hands up those of you who have either an iPad or an equivalent tablet or an e-reader or both. Well, well okay, yes, yes. <laughs> Pretty well total penetration of the technology in this kind of community. Uh, how many of you who have one or other of those devices is currently reading an e-book on it? Well, again, about, probably about half of the population here, right? So this indicates the extent to which uh, the e-book is penetrating society in general because rather than being here as uh, research librarians, you're also here as ordinary human beings, uh, reading for leisure as, uh, as we all do. So, when we look at the e-book and what's happening, uh, as a result of our initial work and as a result of looking at the literature and the news and, and all the rest of it, uh, we find that there are three driving forces that appear to be motivating the expanded use of the e-book. First of all, there's what we might call the development of an appropriate technology and continuous improvement of that technology in terms of storage capacity, 
green definition, and so on. Some argue that the origins of the e-book lie in the work of one Bob Brown, who in 1930 proposed a device which would be a simple reading machine, which I can carry or move around, attached to any old electric light plug, <laughs> rather an odd idea, and read 100,000 word novels in 10 minutes if I want to. And I want to. You will gather from this that Brown's ideas were rather idiosyncratic. Um, he drew attention to the fact that in the world of film, not only were there movies, but there were now talkies. And he said, what we need is the readies. And he was so persuasive that he actually uh, convinced authors such as Gertrude Stein, William Carlos Williams, and Ezra Pound to write readies for his new machine. Uh, the new machine was never actually produced, so... Uh, but you can see these texts um, online. I think at uh, Yale University has a site uh, for Bob Brown's work. And this is what he envisaged the reedy to look like. But what you have to imagine is not that there is a page, because he dispensed with the page. This is just a, an indication of one continuous length of paper tape. Right? So this paper tape would spool underneath a lens which would um, increase the size of the type to any desired size. But Brown's ideas really went, uh, went to somewhat ridiculous lengths because he, he also wanted to change the language so that there were fewer words to express what the author intended. And he wanted to get rid of definite and indefinite articles and so on and so forth and all the kind of functional words in the English language so that he could read a 100,000 word novel in 10 minutes, which <laughs> seems to destroy the notion of the, uh, the glory of the English language to some extent. A highly uh, instrumental way of thinking about reading. Now, I really do doubt that any e-book reader designer has ever read the work of Bob Brown or used his ideas to devise an e-reader. And in fact, we have to wait until 1971 before the notion of the e-book uh, became much of a reality in the work of Michael Hart and the foundation of Project Gutenberg. Uh, Michael Hart's idea was to use the simplest possible format, uh, ASCII, for the text. And he talked not about e-books, but about e-texts. And his adoption of the simplest format meant that Project Gutenberg books, of which there are now around about 40,000, could be read on any computer device, which was, of course, a big advantage. We then have to wait another almost 30 years before the e-reader appeared as a practical reality. When in 1998, two devices were produced, one of which you see here on the screen, the Rocket e-book, and the other was the Softbook e-reader. Uh, the Rocket e-book and the Softbook e-reader each weighed about half a kilo, so not exactly something you would want to slip in your jacket pocket. Um, and they had a capacity of between 10 and 50 books. 10 books basic, 50 books with expansion. All right? Now today's Kindle Paperwhite 2 can hold 1,100 books. Yeah? So the increase in capacity in a relatively short period of time has been absolutely phenomenal. Now, the, the number of books that there are in Project Gutenberg is dwarfed by the number of e-books that are now generally available by other means. For example, there are two so-called Netflix of books services on offer, Oyster and Scribd. Uh, each of these gives you access to 
400,000 books. And you pay a subscription which is less than the price of the average paperback book per month. So you can uh, get a subscription. If you customarily buy one paperback book a month, you get a better bargain by subscribing to one of these services for the year. And uh, I suspect that although subscribers to these services are not generally known, they don't release the information, but Scribe says its app is now on 5 million devices worldwide, and it has monthly 30 million monthly users. Now, monthly users doesn't mean subscribers. It, you know, if you use it 10 times a month, then one person is 10 users. But that's still a significant uh, development in a relatively short time. And that sort of development, that sort of commercial development, very cheap e-lending, clearly has implications for other lending services like libraries. Hmm? Now, the real beginning of the e-book phenomenon seems to date to about 2006. You can see 2006, 2007 is when the curve begins to rise from a fairly flat position. And the interesting thing that this graph draws attention to is that at every point of development, the sales of e-books have exceeded the forecast trend line. In other words, things are happening faster than people believed they would. And uh, quite where the graph is going to go is, um, <laughs> we can hardly tell. We can hardly keep on growing at the same pace. And there are suggestions that in 2012, 2013, uh, sales of e-books reached their peak. And some suggest that they're going to decline hereafter. Um, I have my doubts about that, but uh, it could well be the case. Now, one of the things we have to remember about information on e-books is a lot of it is derived from the situation in the USA and the UK. And the market for English language books is global. You know, America alone is 318 million population. Right? The market is enormous for the English language texts. For other languages, the situation is completely different. And in other countries, there are, for example, in France, has a law about book price maintenance and has recently introduced a further law which says that Amazon, it's used as online providers, <laughs> but they mean Amazon, right? Amazon cannot take the postage cost into account for the 5% discount that is allowed in French law. In other words, if they are going to give free postage, then that is in addition to the 5% discount that they can offer. So you have legal situations that affect the e-book in other countries and in other languages. And of course, you have market size that significantly affects the extent to which the e-book is going to be taken up. However, if we look at the current situation of the production, publication, use, this is a very simplified diagram of, of what actually goes on. But uh, generally, an author writes a book, finds a publisher, either with or without the assistance of an agent. Uh, the publisher produces the book, with all sorts of supplementary services like designers, printers, either in-house or outsourced. Um, the books are distributed to retailers, the bookshops, supermarkets, wherever, and to libraries. And from the retailers and from the libraries, they reach the readers. Now, the thing is, the, the e-book development, if it continues and expands at the same kind of rate 
globally as it is in the English language market um, has the potential to make an impact on every one of these nodes in the diagram. Hmm? Such that what we might see in the future is something like this, a very much simplified situation. In this, the, the dotted lines indicate weakening links that are, indicate the impact of the evil. And the solid lines indicate potentially strengthening links. So, for example, publishers producing e-books can sell directly to readers, so that's a strength. Huh? Authors can decide to sell directly to readers, which is also a strength. Whereas retailers selling to readers and publishers delivering to retailers are likely to weaken because of the different distribution technology of the e-book. And what we're doing in the, uh, in the Swedish project is to look at all of these nodes apart from the agent, right? We, we aren't looking at literary agents. There aren't many of them in Sweden in any case. Now, the second factor, which is probably the main driver from the perspective of the author, is the ease and convenience with which an e-book can be produced even by a single author, single person. It's a simple, straightforward job. You can use iBook Author from Apple. Uh, you can use Kindle's publication process. You can use, produce a PDF file and send it to Smashwords, and they will produce the variant formats for you. So it's a simple business, getting a book out, getting an e-book out. And because you can do it independently of any publisher, agent, or whatever, printer, bookshop, right? it gives you the opportunity to reach readers directly rather than be weeded out by the publisher process. And when we add to convenience the notion of portability which the e-reader devices now give you, um, that is the driving force for the reader. And I think that the main driver for that is the fact that we have a much more mobile and traveling population than, than ever before. In the major cities of the world, for example, uh, the average journey to work time is something like 30 to 40 minutes. Quite enough time if you're traveling by public transport to read two or three chapters of a book. Hmm? And it's that uh, convenience and portability when you're on the move which I think is the significant development for readers of e-books. Going, starting with the author in this, uh, in this diagram, the self-publishing possibility, I think, is the, the biggest development. A couple of quotes here. Self-published books share of the UK market grew by 79% in 2013, with 18 million self-published books bought by UK readers last year. That's a significant impact of self-publishing. And Steve Bohm, a research director of Nielsen Book, has said, the more successful self-publishing is, the more authors will look at it as an option. It's a growth market in the industry. Publishers as well will be looking at it to see how they can harness that. And I think that that is uh, most definitely true. Of course, self-publishing, although it's increased by 79%, 18 million self-published books sold, it's worth 53 million pounds. But that's only 3% of the total book market in the UK which has a value of over 2,100 million, or 2 billion in American numbers. So it's still a tiny fraction of the total sale. And people get misled when they see things like the market grew by 79%, right? Whoa, 
79%. Well, 79% of a small number is still a small number. Huh? And uh, there's a great deal of hype as a result of misunderstanding what is actually going on. Most self-publishing is in genre fiction, detective stories, romance, science fiction, and in children's books. But I think we're going to see, we're already seeing, more self-publishing in the academic uh, arena. For example, in Ireland, uh, EDCO completed a five-year project in 2012 to make e-books available for every core course in the secondary school curriculum. Entirely produced by Irish authors, designers, and developers, these e-books can help create a more interactive learning environment with videos, e-tests, animations, and podcasts. Students can take notes, highlight and search text, and create bookmarks, enabling them to personalize their educational resources as they progress through the exam cycle. Now, if Ireland collectively is generating e-textbooks for the secondary school market, what happens to publishers who are selling into that market? <laughs> it would seem that their market disappears overnight because the bought textbooks are being replaced by the freely available textbooks. The same thing is uh, happening at university level. We've gone through a period of disappearing university presses since about the early 1980s. But the e-book offers universities the possibility of a different economic basis for book production. And in some places, they're being encouraged to produce their own textbooks to go along with online learning resources. An example is in the recommendations of the Florida Open Access test Textbook Task Force. That's difficult to say, isn't it? Which recommends that the Florida Distance Learning Consortium develop professional develop materials, a media kit, and offer an awareness campaign on individual campuses that will raise awareness of and promote the use of open access textbooks and instructional materials. Now, if taken up, and I understand it has been taken up, that could uh, have a significant impact on the, uh, the commercial textbook market because textbooks in America are pricey things. You can pay two or three hundred dollars for, say, a chemistry or biochemistry textbook. And if the universities get their act together and start producing these themselves as open access e-textbooks, then that's a significant impact on the publisher's market. The task force is also very clever in thinking about the implications of this for the academic because they also have a recommendation that involvement in this project should be taken to, into account in promotion and tenure decisions. Right? So the academic gets a potential reward for engaging in this uh, activity. And they further recommend that the university should pay a tax allowance for the performance of the work. So they get both a monetary and a status recognition for the work that they're doing. And if universities latch onto that idea of rewarding people in particular ways that are beneficial to them uh, for tenure, promotion, and so on, then I think the idea could spread uh, quite rapidly. And of course, Florida isn't the only state in the USA that is, uh, that is doing this. This is the site of uh, intermediate, intermediate algebra uh, produced by collegeopentextbooks.org. Hmm? Now, okay, if you've got this open access intermediate algebra textbook, why should you buy any other textbook? The production, the local production of textbooks by universities also gives more autonomy to the instructor 
because previously you had to tailor your course to the textbook. Now you can tailor the textbook to your course and do it the other way around and deliver the course that you want to deliver rather than the course that is implicit in the external textbook. So there's very interesting ideas in the notion of institutional self-publishing in the academic sector. And I just wonder how far that has hit your universities. Um, how many people are in universities where there is uh, either a developed policy for the production of e-textbooks or the use of such textbooks? Hands up. Just one, two, two, right? Okay, well, I think it's going to happen in other places too. I think the, these, uh, these two are probably on the leading edge and uh, others are going to rapidly follow suit in the years to come. The third driving force that we've identified appears to be simply the economic imperative, which is also behind the production of the open source textbooks. Um, and production and distribution costs, whatever the publishers tell you, are lower <laughs> for e-books than they are for printed books. Inevitably, they have to be. The publishers make a great song and dance about how all the development work that has to go into the production of the, the uh, e-book and so forth. Now this counterbalances the savings from printing and so on. But I think that's hype, defensive hype, and it is much cheaper. And the first publishers really to embrace the e-book are an indication of how true this is because they are the major science, technology, and medicine publishers, the Elsevier's and the Springer's of this world, serving the academic research market. And universities are now frequently preferring to buy or license such books in preference to printed books. Publishers of literary and genre fiction, however, seem to be less happy with the e-book development, mainly because they have a great difficulty involving an effective business plan. There's a perception in the community that e-books ought to be cheaper. After all, you're not getting this printed physical object in your hand, are you? So why is it the same price as the printed volume? But if they're to drive the prices down, then this has an impact on their bottom line, and so there's a, a degree of reluctance to, uh, to do this. Um, where am I? Right. One of our surveys has involved publishers, covering not only those who are members of the Swedish Publishers Association, but many more smaller companies, sometimes being just one or two people. And we'll be interviewing those publishers who have agreed to be interviewed. We sent questionnaires to 198 publishers in Sweden. I was rather surprised that we had so many, actually, um, for a population of 9.5 million. It seems uh, quite a large number of publishers. And we had a 55% response rate. Uh, Non-respondents tended to be those from the smaller, smaller companies. About 50% of the responding companies had published, had not published any e-books. And almost 50% of those who had published e-books had produced only 10 or fewer. Hmm? Now, the situation in, in Sweden that might explain this is that the book market in Sweden is heavily dominated by public li sales to public libraries. Hmm? That's the biggest part of the market. Personal book buying is at quite a low level in Sweden. And sales of e-books are about 1 to 2% of total sales. 
whereas in the USA and the UK they're up to about 25%. So the market, the small scale of the market and the structure of the market, the uh, significance of public libraries versus the insignificance of personal book buying are factors that are going to affect the willingness of publishers to get into the e-book business. We typify Sweden as a small language culture, meaning that Sweden has virtually nothing in the way of a worldwide market for its books. And it is perhaps the size of the market that keeps production low. The e-book allows publishers to cut out the distribution channel and sell directly to consumers. In our survey, 52% of those producing e-books were selling directly to readers and saw this as a means of increasing sales. But regardless of what is going on now and uh, massive increases, percentage increases, in the number of loans from public libraries, for example, uh, publishers saw the e-book market in Sweden growing only slowly. And that, I think, is the case, going to be the case in other small language countries. Swedish publishers also seem to be rather ambivalent about self-publishing. Uh, the top line says self-publishing has little relevance for the publishing industry. And just over 50% of the publishers agreed with that statement. But on the other hand, about 80% thought that self-publishing could help to identify new authors. So <laughs> there's a bit of ambivalence here between thinking that it's irrelevant, but thinking that you can identify potentially new authors for your, uh, for your business. Also, only a very small proportion thought that self-publishing was a threat to their market position, second off bottom line, the green band. But about 25% thought that they ought to be developing their own self-publishing channel. So, again, ambivalence. If it's not a threat to the market, why do you want to get into it? Hmm? So there's a great deal of uncertainty. What this, what this graph shows, I think, is the great deal of uncertainty that there is in the publishing world about where e-books are going to go for the ordinary domestic reader market, right? as distinct from the, the academic market. And when we look specifically at what inhibits uh, the growth of the market, as I said before, about 75% think that it is the limited size of the Swedish book market and the lack of an export market for Swedish books. <coughs> they also, quite uh, almost 75% of the respondents felt that the existing uh, agreement on e-lending through public libraries was a barrier and that was certainly reflected by our surveys of librarians. In other words, when we look at the impact of the e-book on publishers, we can't take the USA-UK situation to be universal. <coughs> Far from it. What we've called the small language countries, there are all sorts of factors affecting the situation. And the dominant factor is likely to be the size of the home market, the small size of the home market. We have uh, collaborated with colleagues. Whoops, too early. Never mind. We've cooperated with colleagues in, in other places. Uh, researchers are using the questionnaire we've developed, translating it into their own language, and using it with publishers in uh, Croatia and Lithuania to even smaller language countries. And. Um, We've got the results from Croatia where only 40% of the publishers had published e-books. Although 70% of those who hadn't said they intended to do so over the next two or three years. So in these countries we're likely to have a much slower growth of e-books in the market than in the English language book market. 
When we turn to book selling, uh, we've just completed the survey of booksellers in Sweden and we haven't got round to analysing the data yet. It's difficult to pick out the impact of e-books against the impact of online selling. Uh, the big impact on the market has been Amazon, of course. And we've seen not only the collapse of borders in the USA, but also reduction in the number of Barnes and Noble's bookstores in the USA. Independent uh, bookshops in the UK are closing at the rate of between 50 and 100 a year. Uh, there are now more bookshops in Japan with a population less than half the size of the USA than there are in the USA. So bookshops are taking a hit, booksellers are taking a major hit, mainly through online bookselling. But because they don't have the infrastructure to sell e-books, most of them are not selling e-books, for example out of the 48 responses we got in Sweden, only six bookshops were selling e-books. And, you know, when you think about it, what, you know, why do they need to? Why would anybody go to a bookshop to buy an e-book if they've got an internet connection? And in Sweden, something like 98% of the population has access to the internet. So, what's the point of bookshops trying to get into the e-book market? And the six that were selling e-books were most probably those owned by one or other of the big publishers in Sweden. Yes, yes, yes. I shall now move on to the conclusion. I think what we're seeing is uh, the phenomenon of disintermediation, which is a, a buzzword of what's happening to retailing generally in the internet. I think the expansion of readership is going to continue. I think it's going to be driven predominantly through the use of e-textbooks in schools, so that we will have generations growing up for whom the book means the e-book. Hmm? And the notion that the market is going to collapse any time soon, I think, is, is mistaken. Because, because of its use in basic education and uh, later in university education, uh, it's going to spread out from those sectors into uh, the population at large. And this means that all of those areas that are at risk are going to be at even more risk in the time to come. And I was uh, gratified to see that LIBA has a uh, part of its program, the development of a vision for the new research library, because I think that new research library is going to be needed just as new phenomena in public libraries are going to be needed. I can uh, leave you with... Uh, See, we have to miss a lot. To find out more, you can keep in touch with the Swedish project through our blog. Um, Information Research, volume 19, number 2, the current issue, has uh, eight papers on e-book research, including three from the, uh, the Swedish project. And about 18 months ago, I created a flipboard magazine called News on e-books. If you have a, an iPad or an uh, Android tablet, you can access uh, that, and you can also access it uh, on the web. Um, quite amazingly, it now has more than 33,000 subscribers, which is, um, indicates, the, I think, the interest in uh, the e-book phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. If you have questions to Tom, you can take it outside because we have to go away okay. now. Right. Uh, it is the poster presentations now, so I would like the ten first posters to come up here at the front, and I would like the presentation for the posters to be on the screen.
And during lunch break, you can get down to level zero and look at the posters. They are hanging down there. So go down and look at the nice posters. Are you standing on number one? So we start here. We have poster number one. You're welcome. Thank you. So after e-books, uh, let's talk about e-sounds. This poster presents uh, European Sounds, which is a project gathering 24 partners, including national libraries and archive and research centers that comes from more than 12 European countries. In three years' time, European Sounds will make accessible half a million recordings. The recordings will include from music to samples of dialects, uh, sounds of nature, and speeches. In brief, European Sounds will open up online access to Europe's rich and diverse acoustic heritage. All internet users will be able to search, navigate, and experience thousands of recordings. It will also be possible to interact with them, for example, by tagging, describing, and mis mixing sounds, and sharing the results. European As Sounds aims at building a network of persons interested and stakeholders. So please spread the word and join us on a journey to make European acoustic heritage accessible to everyone. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Alistair Dunning. I work for the European Library, but I also coordinate this uh, project, European the Cloud. Um, Today is a very good day to talk about European the Sound, European the Cloud, because European in the past few minutes has just published its new strategy for 2015 to 2020, and that's available via the European website. This project here is a core part of that strategy. European runs a system of data providers, aggregators, which all give content together to Europeana so that they can redistribute it in other ways. Those aggregators all have different technical systems, different staff, different experience, different software. What Europeana Cloud is trying to do is to create a shared technical infrastructure, firstly for the aggregators to Europeana and then for other potential data providers or interested parties to join. It will allow for the sharing of data to be much easier, the management, we hope it's going to reduce IT costs. Um, and we hope in the long run it will also mean that more data shared within the European ecosystem is used in new and innovative ways. Thank you. Hello, I'm Uldis Boyars from the National Library of Latvia, and the topic of my poster is Library Link Data in Latvia. On the left hand side, you can see the current state of library link data uh, here, which uh, to the best of our knowledge is limited to what we have at the National Library. Um, so the, uh, the left hand side uh, shows uh, some of the existing systems that have link data functionality and the challenges that we're facing. On the right hand side, there are uh, planned future developments or work in progress. Uh, which includes um, a pilot project for creating a diverse collection of uh, digital uh, resources and exposing them as linked data and creating the hub for Latvia's authority data. But, uh, like I said before, um, uh, one of the limitations is that we are the only one uh, that we know of uh, who's doing library linked data, so we would want to establish uh, contact with others interested in the field and to establish a competence center for linked data and open data for cultural heritage organizations in Baltic states. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Melo Rodriguez from Min University. I'm uh, the project coordinator for Foster. Foster, uh, this is not the image of our poster. The poster is nicer than downstairs. Uh, Foster is a project, uh, two-year project, focused on training and, dissem and uh, dissemination. 
uh, aiming to support the different stakeholders, uh, especially young, young researchers in adopting open access and facilitate the adoption of uh, and implementation of the open access policies, uh, especially the policies from Horizon 2020. We will do this by uh, uh, three main activities, two of them heavily relying on the community participation. Uh, in fact, apart from uh, the foster portal that is being currently developed by the consortium, uh, we rely on the community to identify relevant content ca that can be reused on, in the context of the training activities and, and, uh, and also uh, we rely on the community to develop a comprehensive training program addressing all the relevant stakeholders and securing the uh, national and disciplinary diversity uh, uh, throughout Europe. Foster has funds to support organizations that are willing to develop training in open access and open science in Europe so uh, contribute your content to foster and stay tuned for the, uh, and apply for the call for proposals for training courses that we will release in, Octo in early October and visit our posters downstairs where you can also get a nice MOOC card. Thank you. So as you have already noticed, this is um, a slide. Uh, related to my poster. I'm Birgit Schmidt from Göttingen University and I can tell you a bit more about a study which was published a couple of months ago by the Open Air Project. It's a, a study about um, legal questions, legal issues and solutions um, uh, of use. I mean, they, a team, uh, international team of, of researchers, legal researchers, studied our infrastructure and in this context, the use of data uh, and um, studied some, uh, some use cases, but also um, compared legal systems for, for, for selected countries. And in particular, when you look into research data, you uh, will, will notice that this is not so much the protection of the data, which then uh, comes into, into play, but it's the uh, European uh, database uh, protection framework which you have to study. So it's more the environment where you run into some, some questions and I'm, I'm happy to receive your questions and um, this is a book which you can find online. It's open access and it's published by the Göttingen University Press. So please go and <laughs> have a look. Thank you. Hello, my name is Martin Winsent. I come from the Stockholm University Library, and I'm here to talk about publishing support and infrastructure in the making. I would like to start by saying that this poster title is a lie, and I'll get back to that in about 53 seconds. Um, after the decision taken by the Vice Chancellor at Stockholm University, the University Library was given the, the um, task uh, to develop a new Stockholm University press. Uh, the library was given the task because the, resource, the right resources were at the library to carry out this task efficiently. Uh, the three uh, cornerstones of the press is open access, everything must be published open access and free for all. E is default. And finally, all publications will be peer reviewed according to international standards. <clears throat> when we submitted this poster, uh, we had uh, about an idea and a goal what the, the, what the press was going to be, not much else. Uh, and that was about five months ago. Now, actually, we have an infrastructure up and running for publications, and uh, that's why this uh, title is a lie. Uh, so please come and see what we did and what we do, and visit our poster, or visit stockholmuniversitypress.se. Thank you very much. Spread the word. Hi, my name is Marion Borowski from Fraunhofer Research Center in Germany, and we are one of the founding members of the Impact Center um, in Digitization, uh, the Impact Center of Competence in Digitization. The Impact Center of Competence in Digitization is a not-for-profit organization with a mission to make the digitization of historical printed text better, faster, and cheaper. It provides tools, services, and facilities to further advance the state of the art in the field of document imaging, language technology, and the processing of historical text. The Impact Center of Competence in Digitization 
brings together a productive network of experts in digitization, including libraries, scientists, industry partners, and digitization professionals. So for example, if you either need advice in digitization, or you want to test research or commercial tools, or to upload them, or you want to exchange with experts. So please join the partner network, the impact center of competence in digitization for a, for a low fee. Please come and visit me at the poster number seven, and um, I will be happy to give you more information and uh, as well to listen to your thoughts. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Oksana Zaitseva. I am a system librarian uh, in the Scientific Library of Riga Technical University. The topic of my poster is the implementation of RFID technology in RTU library. Our library is one of the first lab libraries in Latvia that has implemented RFID technology. It was realized within a framework of the project RTU City Within a City. These innovations provide our uh, library with sustainable protection of books, with satisfaction of our students and academic staff with library services. Please take a look at my poster and I'll be glad to answer to your questions. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lise Lempinen and I work in the University of Tartu Library, but today I'm representing the wider uh, community of Estonian memory institutions. So we have come up with a plan uh, how to preserve Estonian um, cultural heritage. And currently the Estonian e-repository has six partners, but we are hoping that in the end many more um, institutions will contrib contribute into the process. So our plan works as a circle of pr uh, procedures and each partner plays a different role in different uh, parts of the um, circle. So we start first by um, uh, identifying important um, materials that has a value for Estonian culture, identity and heritage. Then we mass neutralize these uh, materials, digitize them, uh, send them to long-term pr preservation and finally make it all uh, available through open access e-portal. And of course then we return the original materials to the original institution. Uh, we are currently in the process of um, setting up the infrastructure so the real work will actually start next year and hopefully everybody will have an access and um, will um, gain a lot from our project. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mari Baez. I am from UOC Virtual Library and I am presenting my poster. I want you to visit my poster, so I'll do a brief summary to encourage you to visit it. What is the context? Published in open access is an obligation imposed by the European Union, but the researchers also need to publish in high impact uh, your journals to highlight the quality of their research. The UOC Virtual Library has developed a tool to help researchers and librarians to combine both aspects. The tool is based on information from free platforms, the directory of open access journals, the Web of Science Journal Citation Report, and the Scopus Eisemago Journal Rank. The tool provides access to lists of open access journals on Web of Science and on Scopus. Come and visit my poster to learn more about how you can simultaneously publish in open access and publish in high impact. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you to all the poster presentations. And go down and look at the posters. It's really interesting on the level zero. Uh, and at lunch, you can also go out and look at our sponsors' tables. They're just outside of here. They want to have people looking at them. Uh, and an invitation to lunch will come here.
Thank you very much, Mr. Lieber, for allowing me to say another couple of words. Um, yesterday, the European Library ran a really busy workshop on linked data. We are running uh, a session at 12.30 in room 81D beneath. If your library is interested in working with us and creating linked data um, and uh, looking at some of the other services that the European Library offers, then please come to that session at 12.30 today. Thank you.